immediately. Talk about luck. Uh, there is a small sp square of um, stuff where I don't have boxes and it happened to land exactly in that box. So I did hear it ping off a box and that could have been a lot worse. Oh, just a moment while I catch my breath and we'll dive back into it. So I do suspect it's catching on the, the plastic on the inside where the arm is actually supported but I don't know how it actually go about oh actually yes I do I would do it on the arm instead okay that makes things simpler um, and I do see some spur lines there. Uh, actually if I see spur lines I should be shaving them off with a scalpel yeah I was looking at uh, tools for removing spurs so Citadel has one, but then I decided that it wasn't worth it. Especially for the money they wanted for it. Now I did get their um, pliers and I've had mixed feelings about the quality of them. The uh, It's a really, really, really bad CNC job, but they actually, despite all my complaints about them, uh, they do the job incredibly well, so I, I don't know how I feel about that to be honest. Like I can see visual defects, but when you actually go to cut something, they doesn't seem to cause a problem at all. So mainly with the blade not coming together across the entire length of the blade, that's um, a big one. But I guess the active cutting area, that is actually surface to surface, and I guess that really is all that matters. Oh, curved surfaces are a pain to deal with. Um, In there. Good, you're practically popping out, which is what I want. Uh, that's better. Still not there. So don't use tweezers, use pliers. You should be able to get a better grip on it. And don't try and pull it out in one go. That's a trick. Pull it out a couple of mils at a time. And these are magnetized, aren't they? Great. We'll go back to the polishing. So back and forward and just slightly vary the angle every couple of passes just to keep it nice and smooth and in shape. Um, I suspect my issue is also on the top, so I'm going to flatten it on a surface like this. You won't be able to see it, but I'm just doing it running along the edge of the table and then doing the same thing. The problem is it's got a uh, the ball head there, and that gets that interferes with going flat. So that's it. Just easier to do it on the side of the table to fix that. Cool. Goes in like that. That's feeling smoother. Pin goes in. Uh, okay. So back and forward, uh, or up and down, as you can see here in the image, there is a. Actually, I'll push that in. Uh, there is a slight gap, which is good. So it's not at the top and the bottom it isn't touching it just appears to be this plastic frame here is actually it's got like a, a cutout and I'm guessing it's touching in there and that is smoother than before so I'm going to assume that's the case <sighs> and it was going so well on the uh, the sandpapering side actually I should set a cutoff time so it is 8 30 so I can really only go for about another half hour maximum and I've got things I need to get done Kind of annoying that real life gets in the way. I wish I could just uh, quit and do mini Z building, but uh, unfortunately that's not going to pay the bills. And my skills seem to be in fairly high demand these days. Which I must admit in many respects is rather annoying.
makes it very, very difficult to take a holiday, basically. Okay. Seems better. Okay, how does that feel? That feels, so every time I do it, it, it seems to feel smoother and smoother, which is a good sign. Oh God, that's still really, really, really stiff. Oh no, okay. So I just had my monitor turn off. I actually wonder if you saw my um, my screensaver, and if that's the case, I'll be able to check that on the stream later, which would be good, and finally answer that question. So it's not falling down underneath under its own pressure. So maybe we just focus on the other side for now. Yeah, let's do that. So we're going to give a couple of passes on the inside here. Good. And then I take off any uh, extra material, any it accumulated. Cool. And we polish it all up. Oh, there's my sandpaper. We actually might use that. Um, check for spurs. Yes, there's a tiny bit there. Where did I put that tool? There you are. I can hear it clicking. I mean, you can try and take that off with sandpaper, but I've found that the quickest, most effective way is just to take it off with a scalpel, and then that makes the sandpapering process go a lot smoother. And just drag across it diagonally also seems to help, rather than directly across it. Okay, um, I'm not going to go for the P1000, I think. Try and cut off a bit more material than previously. And because we mainly care about the top, um, run it along the edge of the table here. Okay, that's looking good. Let's see how you fit. Okay, so back and forward is good. No clearance issues there. Put the pin in and that is really, 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 really stiff. There we go. Ignore my own advice about taking only a couple of mils at a time. Back to polishing. Although we're actually more removing material than anything else. To be honest, that is smooth enough that the spring it over, just overtake it. In fact, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna continue on here. I don't foresee it being an issue. And if it is, luckily, due to the way this is designed, it should be relatively easy to pull back off. All right, smooth that out. Someone just commented on, uh, I posted earlier today on Twitch a uh, small robotic dog 
and I've been wanting to build one of those for years. Uh, so sort of like the one from Boston Dynamics, but funny enough in like 128 scale, it's something about that big. Um, the problem with those robots is there's normally a lot of servos and it's not that the servos present a lot of issues, it's that, that a lot of servos is really expensive if you get good ones. So I need two X4 TMs. So um, yeah, hopefully that will be released in the next couple of days. Um, he originally had a cat model and then um, that was just a one-off he did for himself and then he did a Kickstarter for one. But the problem with the Kickstarter one he did was um, it was all made out of uh, lasered um, ply plyboard and was of lower quality and I really wanted the full articulation and high quality plastics. So that's what it looks like he's doing this time around and I'm definitely looking forward to that. BE2515, that's a bearing, isn't it? Yeah, that's... Oh, okay, so we're into the steering setups. That is these. And this is where the uh, the GL racing is great because I can still look up those parts. So that was from Bag B. And... Oh, I've got my audio levels are good. And we've only got three of them. So I did just pull out the right ones, which is awesome. So let's do that. Uh, that's going to be a metal part for the bottom there. Uh, sometimes I feel like this is frustration driven development. No, I wanted KMs, didn't I? There's KBs. No, I did want KBs. So we'll take two out of the bag here and just set them aside. And we will work out the placement of the plate. Does that come from the top? Yes, it does. So we'll do that and we'll get that. Oh, that's interesting. I thought there's some holes there. Does it go that way? Oh, okay. No, it does go through the top. And then these don't screw into the metal, they actually screw into the plastic. So that goes that way. But how does that... Oh, okay, it goes over the top. Wow, that's kind of tricky. And that holds it into place like that. So the black part goes, you've got the two holes there for the metal part and then the other four holes go into the plastic. So that's interesting. And then you only screw in two of those. So I'm guessing there must be more on the front end that comes later. Let's do that then. Let's tighten it up. Make sure I apply some pressure to the plastic. Not too much, but just enough to hold it in place so it mates down correctly. If you've got, if the screw doesn't clear the carbon fiber and it digs into the carbon fiber and pushes the plastic away, um, it can cause, it can be difficult to correct that after the fact. Like you want to drill into the plastic f correctly the first time um, because it's more difficult to fix it up later. <coughs> Oh, that's interesting. Is that only... Okay, so I think the bearings are only just large enough to go over the screws. What am I doing here? Is there any play there? It doesn't appear to be. Okay. That's a good sign. Getting them on, however, is a bit more difficult than that. So, <laughs> I keep on putting pressure on my finger where the bearing is to sort of hold it in place and grip it. But the problem is because it's a bearing, my finger just rolls right off it. Let's get, get more into the camera. And I'm not gonna push too tight there. Even though it is a bearing and it is a play, a placing load on the inner race or the inside of the bearing, um, as you may know it. 
Um, and so compressing that is not going to compress the balls on the outside and therefore not cause misalignment. I still don't want to um, cause the metal to bow outwards and put more pressure on the bearings. So it doesn't have to be too hot, too tight. Um, the bearing should provide prevent it from prevent it from rotational loads that would undo the screw. So as you go left and right, there's a potential that it would cause it, them to back out automatically, but the bearing should help prevent that. So if it is an issue, what I'll do is I'll just lock tight it later. Uh, for now, I'm not going to really bother too much. Yeah, you know what? These arms are growing on me some somewhat. I don't really think I want to. Um, push the envelope and get them absolutely perfect. Uh, I think I'll let the springs do the work there. Oh, cool, so we'll take out the next metal part and the weird metal tube thing, which I'm assuming is probably for this bearing. We'll find out when I turn my head now. Huh, I was right. Okay, so we need... Uh, totally unnecessary screw and I say that because I just use a 2x4 of the exact type, same type of screw and now it's asking for a 2x3 and I find that excessive especially if they only provide one of them 1, 2.5 it's not that one, it's not that one One, two, four. I'm going to assume it's the unlabeled bag with two different types of screws in it. So this might be an interesting opportunity to show you how to use a, a caliper. So I'm going to measure out. I only need three mil. So I'm going to measure out three mil by making sure I can see three lines. So one, two, three. I don't know if we can see that on the video, but you'll see that the, we went from zero and then there's three lines after it and I lined up the outside of that. So that's now three millimeters apart and on the outside from tip to tip is three millimeters. Um, but more importantly, I've got a depth gauge on the end. So that is actually protruding by three millimeters. So I can just put the screws on the end like that and measure the depth. And that's two by three millimeters. And that one is too small. That's probably, yeah, this is two mils high. So calipers are great. Ones with wheels make things a lot simpler. Uh, digital ones make things even simpler. This allows you to measure some distance and then lock it in place so it doesn't move, which is really, really handy. Uh, this, These two allow you to measure the inside diameter of something or the inside of two spots. This allows you to measure the outside. Um, you can either measure with the pointy ends, but for measuring the width of like um, the, uh, the ball ends and everything, I much prefer to do it against the flat sides because it's a bit easier to work with. Um, and it's actually the same, like that's a straight line up there. As long as you're not measuring it right up here where there's an indentation, you should be fine. And then finally, you've got down here the, uh, the depth gauge. So you, you can put it inside something and see how deep it goes or if you want to measure how long a screw is you can do it against that which is a bit easier than trying to line it up here and have the head sitting on the outside for example. Um, and you'll see it's actually got a notch in it as well and that's just in, in case the inside is tapered slightly. It brings the, uh, the measuring side in a tiny bit. If you don't want that and you want to measure it on the inside diameter right up against the wall you just spin it around and measure it with that side. So. Very, very simple to use. Um, if you want the ultra high, oh, I don't think I've even got on this. You, you can get a lot of precision out of calipers, so sub millimeter, just using an eyeball. Um, but the digital ones definitely make it a lot easier. Um, and the way they do sub millimeter precision is kind of awesome, but I recommend looking up another guide on YouTube because I don't have calipers like that handy at the moment. Cool. I just got stuck to the magnet, so let's do this bearing. Yeah, 
awesome. So this uh, little thing I'm screwing into has a square cutout on the bottom. And I believe that goes back and forward. So I'm not going to over tighten it because it's going to be very, very difficult because I've got no, uh, no ability to grasp it. So I'm going to have a look where that goes. Oh, okay, and there's that two millimeters. So they did put the screws you need in the same bag. That was a nice touch of them. I was wondering about that, why there, there were two different screws in the same bag. So let's put you aside. And I'm guessing the screw size, like the, the design here is dictating the screw sizes, but I don't have to like it, so I'm not going to. Don't know how I'm going to get this in, to be honest. been some tight spots before but this is pretty tight oh, you're not gonna make it. oh you know what the trick I bet is to put the bearing in second and to get this in first yep because I know I can Put my finger on top so it's just my screensaver going off again um, load up the screw put it through not tighten it because it actually goes back and forward and we will be calibrating it later but just enough so it doesn't move around too much so when it stops moving with just applying light pressure just back it off half a turn and then you can move it back and forward to calibrate it which probably didn't show up well on the camera, but I tend to find what, I'm, what I see and record locally is slightly different to what you see when uh, I upload it, and everything I upload seems to be just a tiny bit smoother. Um, I actually wonder if what I see on screen is lower frames per second, because I normally jack the frames per second up to 60, um, especially because I've got enough lighting to do that, but it just makes... Um, it gets rid of a lot of blurring and a lot of ghosting and gives you a lot more crisper detail. Like I've actually got the uh, the sharpness turned right up just so you can see the detail. Um, unfortunately we're doing a lot of stuff with black and I'm wearing a black jacket and that's not really helping. Um, although having a look at it, look at it, the dynamic range across the, uh, the jacket isn't bad. It could be better, but um, I need to play with the webcam a bit more for that. But considering this is an ad hoc stream, I'm just going to take it and be happy with it. Okay, two five oh twos, three oh two fives. Hello, two five oh twos. The smaller bearing types. So the smaller, uh, smaller ball types. Now, I think I need the smaller head to go on the top of these. It's not that. It's probably this one. No, that's too small. What about the full-sized one? No, that's too big. Oh, actually, uh, yeah, let's do that. I wanted to show one thing. So I tried to do some bounce experiments before with this chassis and I couldn't find anything that was a good weight for it. So you see it bouncing around. That's not good. That's not really reflective of what this is actually going to do in real life. But if I put these on there, you can see it goes down, which is good. But if I, this is why I like this chassis. At this height, the, uh, the Kyosho Mini Z would be bouncing all over the place and this just sticks, so. Really, really, really do like that. I guess that's a bonus for anyone who's actually watching the full video here. I have to extract that out and make that a smaller video. There we go, that's the right piece. Piece, piece, piece. God, it's hard to talk when you get tired. Okay. Oh, now that's actually rotating a bit, so that's actually slightly undersized. So let's try this. 
slightly too large. I've uh, learned an important lesson in the par past with regards to hex bits and screws and everything, especially with Mini Z's, it's always use the right, uh, right tool bit. Um, even if it's close, you're just going to cause yourself more damage. And it's even worse when you take into account that there's such thing as an imperial measurement size. Like, I know the US loves it, but wow, it doesn't make things difficult for the rest of the world. Still trying to see what the benefit of that is. Now, I launched a part across the room. Or did, is it on the table somewhere? Quick go with the magnet, just to be sure. Uh, stand up. No, it's not on my lap. Okay, we're just going to pull out another one in that case. I think I've got some of these spares anyway, so I just want to make progress tonight. While I'm doing that, I'll just keep an eye on the table to see if I spot it. Yeah, so as I was saying, I, um, I've stripped out enough parts and tools now to know that you just want to not go too tight and make sure you use the right part. And uh, if you're screwing in aluminium, you want to be using steel. And if you're screwing in steel, you want to be using aluminium. Or at least a different metal because if you apply high pressure to something of the same material uh, you can end up fusing the two materials together and that normally exhibits itself by being very very difficult to undo okay so that goes in the top somehow I'd have to back that out. No, that go, that's gone down. But I thought that would be better retained than that. Oh, actually, okay, now I have to screw it. I have to tighten it, don't I? So let's have a look at the surface. Okay, so it's hard to see, but there's actually channels on either side to keep it centered uh, on both sides. So you keep it loose enough to get it in, and then it looks like you tighten it down. Uh, you bring everything together and pinch it in so this is going to be annoying and difficult to do um, not far off which is good and swap over pieces It's one of the reasons why I like this screwdriver, because you can swap it over with one hand. That's good. Let's try and bring it in a bit closer. It's too tight. Too tight. Still too tight. Back it off. Too loose. Oops, that sounds good. Just bring it down a notch. Don't know if there's a really good way to describe what I'm doing here, but pushing it down, I can feel like it clicking slightly. So I just move it up ever so slightly and tighten it just enough, then back it off a bit, bring it up a bit further until it runs smooth. But it's um, not the easiest thing in the world to do. Okay, so that's captured but incredibly loose. Let's put it over back there. Too 
tight. I'm just using my thumb to lever it as well because it can be very hard to do very very fine movements. So it's going back, it's going back and forward really really smoothly, and then I'm just pushing it up and down and seeing how much wiggle it's got, and then to and from the camera. That seems pretty good. And the one thing to keep in mind is as you're tightening screws, it'll go in or tight. It can actually cause everything to shift around. So just tighten a bit more at a time. And all right, so going back and forward like that, there's not much play. Rotationally, there's not much play. You could go a tiny bit tighter, I think. And even a tiny bit tighter than that. So I'll just put the screwdriver in, ram my finger up against the screw, then untighten, put a bit more force on my thumb, so force it down a bit, and then tighten it back up. And that just helps to make very, very minor changes. And then the other way around to loosen it up, uh, I'll put a lot of force on the screwdriver and force it up while it's still tightened, then untighten it and sort of lever it up like that and then go back in. And that, that seems to give me quite a bit of control in terms of um, precision. Still not perfect, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, this is now where I want it to be, which is good. Um, so you might have to do it a couple of times, but that's no biggie. I mean, you shouldn't be trying to do this quickly. So, Okay, this is actually pretty good. So there's no wetting, no jamming, very, very smooth. In fact, that's one of the smoothest front ends I've ever seen. This is going to be a joy to drive, I think. Okay, so we're nearly there and it's 9 o'clock, so I'm going to finish up now. It's been half an hour. Uh, tomorrow we will be working on finishing up the front end. Um, and then after that we'll be making the electronics. So I fully expect to have the chassis finished tomorrow. And that's still smooth, which is good. Um, yeah, so we will probably have this running by Friday, which will be really, really good. So thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks for putting up with me, uh, losing parts and then coming back almost immediately. And um, don't stop building. See ya.